Now, as much as the debate about whole language and phonics has rocked the Canadian educational system for the last few decades, one other big controversy is that of a bilingual education. Bilingualism is something that's very common in the human species. In fact, if we look at the world, most people in Europe, Asia, Africa, and South America are bilingual and are fluent in at least two languages. However, most people in North America are not. And although bilingualism is increasing in prevalence in Canada, the majority of Canadians still today are only fluent in English. And so bilingualism isn't just the ability to know a few words in a new language. Bilingualism, by definition, is fluency. And fluency, for the purpose of this course, will be defined as the ability to carry on an everyday conversation. And so can you carry on an everyday conversation in two or more languages, whether spoken, written, or assigned? And so it's the idea that this is something that we don't tend to prioritize as much as we should in Canada. But we should. There's lots of developmental benefits. So to discuss these benefits, let's talk about early and late bilingualism. So an early bilingual is a person who begins being exposed to two or more languages at some point in their childhood or earlier. Infancy is the best, but if you can't be exposed to two languages in infancy, toddlerhood's the next best, or preschool or elementary. And so if you're exposed to two or more languages in elementary school or earlier, and you become fluent in those two languages, you're considered to be an early bilingual. What happens in early bilinguals is, is they tend to retain their sensitivity to the phonemes in both of their spoken languages. This is the idea that they can hear the nuances and the different inflections and the different vowels in both those languages. In terms of their neurological development, they actually develop mirrored and parallel brain systems. What I mean by this is if you think about a schematic map or how different words are connected in our brain, let's say a person is fluent in English and French, what happens is the way their English words are connected mirrors the way their vocabulary in French is connected. And that's because they learn things like the word dog in English, they also might learn the word chien. Or if they learn about holidays in English, they might be learning about the same holidays in French at the same time. And so their schematic maps are mirrored or identical. This almost gives them this special ability or this portal they can jump through. For example, in this illustration, let's say the red's the English schematic map and the blue is the French. What happens is they may be having a conversation and going down one area of their English uh, language tree and then they could jump through a parallel universe to their French language tree and continue on the conversation. And then as they're talking to French, they continue on, maybe they're using a word in French and they want to now jump the conversation back to English. Because they have parallel and mirrored brain regions, they can do that. It's like jumping between parallel universes or through a portal. And I like to also use the example of a tree. As they're growing in both their languages, their trees become complementary and identical. What we know is early bilingualism helps us with our neural organization. Through having these parallel trees, it helps the speed of our processing all around. We can be faster thinkers. We can process non-linguistic material way faster. This includes things like infant habituation. We talked about way back in physical development, but it's the idea that when you are looking at things like a red ball versus a blue ball, you'll habituate to one of them faster. You will process non-linguistic information quicker. This is different than a late bilingual. A late bilingual is a person who begins becoming fluent in a second language in adolescence or beyond. So this could be a person who joined late immersion in grade seven, let's say. And so in late bilinguals, what we find is they start off with a struggle. Being a late bilingual is more work than being an early bilingual. And that's because your brain has pretty much solidified in one language or what I like to call one operating system. And now you're trying to run it on a second operating system. And so you don't start off with those parallel trees. You actually start off with your brain mainly in one language with the area around your second language as a small little area that's kind of confined to itself that has to slowly grow. And building those synapses as a late bilingual takes a lot more work and a lot more effort. But although there's this short-term struggle, the long-term benefits of being a late bilingual cannot be understated. What we find is once you work at it hard enough, you actually become faster at processing linguistic information, you become better at reasoning about linguistic things and nuance like poetry, and you tend to overall have a much larger vocabulary than monolinguals. In addition, your neural health tends to improve. We know whether you're an early or a late bilingual, individuals who are fluent in two languages tend to be at a much decreased risk for things like dementia. 
Now there's two really neat things that late bilinguals tend to do that I like to acknowledge. One of them is they meet the linguistic threshold a lot quicker than early bilinguals. What this means is because they're already in adolescence, they've met a linguistic threshold for their first language. Because they tend to be joining that second language later on, they are fluent in their first language. And so by this time, they've mastered a lot of stuff with their first language that we've already talked about. They've mastered the grammar, they've mastered the semantic meanings, they've mastered a lot of the pragmatics. And what happens is they can take all that stuff they learned from their first language, because they have that threshold, they're able to now do the second neat thing called the cross-linguistic transfer and transfer it over to their second language. So they may not be very exposed to their second language yet, but they understand some underlying grammar structure. They understand what adverbs are. They understand what pronouns are, and they can take that right over. And some of it may not apply, but, but the stuff that is useful is going to give them a head start and a bit of a boost. What's really cool is if they are in an immersion program in junior high and high school, they might be learning a lot of stuff they didn't learn in the first language. They might be losing a lot of science terminology or math concepts in their second language. And then what can happen is they can do this cross-linguistic transfer back once they meet the linguistic threshold for their second language. So once they get fluent in their second language that they're learning high school math in, let's say, they can take all that back to their first language and understand those math concepts in their first language again. Now, although it's been clear that bilingualism is good for our brain, we don't tend to emphasize it enough in our Canadian curriculum. In fact, bilingualism in Canada remains a highly controversial issue. Some of the issues around this are accessibility. Some regions in Canada don't have equal access to French immersion or English immersion or Spanish immersion programs. In some areas, teachers do not have the resources to help a child in French immersion if they are not at the top of the class. Meaning if they have an IPP or an exceptionality related to ADHD or autism or a learning disability, they will not be allowed to into the French immersion program. In many cases in Canada, we prohibit kids with other exceptionalities from even attempting to become bilingual, saying that they can't handle it or that a second language learning program is not for them because of their other exceptionalities. We also know that bilingualism in Canada, especially our French immersion programs, have been used as a political football for many decades. And this is the idea that constantly politicians tend to cut or improve or modify our French immersion programs constantly to the point that it's always a moving target and how we can enter a bilingual program or how, what we need to qualify can really change. And because of this politicized nature, some areas don't support it as much or don't encourage bilingual education, saying that it's not worth it or that it's just a struggle. And another big issue is in the areas where we do have a well-supported French immersion program, it's often our English core programs that struggle. So what happens in many cities is the teachers who teach French immersion tend to get the students who don't have exceptionalities, who don't have IPP programs, and who are only the strong students. Those teachers in those classrooms tend to be the most well-trained, tend to be the most positively received teachers, and those classrooms tend to be more well-funded and better organized. In comparison, the children with the exceptionalities that get stuck in their English speaking programs tend to have teachers that don't have as much training, that don't get as much positive reception, and they tend to have underfunded and under-resourced classrooms. Because of this, it's a huge equity problem where children who are in English core programs get a more remedial education, and that is not fair. And so we need to work this out. We need to find a way that we can offer a bilingual education in Canada that is equitable and fair for all. If you think about education and language, we definitely emphasize the importance of good oral comprehension and good written language skills, but we often neglect the importance of bilingual education. You've now made it to the end of Unit 6. Well done. Thank you for watching.